Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for Nikolai for inviting me, for Skipper, for everything. He's been, you know, watching me grow up. And all of you for being here, an amazing turnout. All right, that's enough of me talking. No, actually, I, I really do want to hear something from you guys right off the bat. Who would be really excited, love to hear a newscaster or someone say something like, the Razorbacks are 2-0, and I think they're really going to be competitive this year. Raise your hand if you think that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> really? That's it? <coughs> okay, well, what about this one? Who thinks it would be really great to hear a newscaster or someone say something like, the nation needs to be more competitive. Raise your hand. It doesn't matter who says that. I mean, it could be President Obama, it could be Rush Limbaugh, it could be Bill Gates, right? And any one of them, and we'd all go, oh, okay, whatever. I don't think that's news. I think it would make news if President Obama said, well, I think the nation needs to be less competitive. That might make news. But you know, the nation needs to be more competitive, the Razorbacks need to be more competitive, not an issue. All right, one more. Who would be happy, love to hear it, if you heard, you're really competitive? One. <laughs> she said some of us know it's true. Yes, but knowing it's true and having someone tell it to you, right? But what's the difference? Why is it suddenly we're so uncomfortable? We were like, yes, ooey hogs. I don't want to be competitive. Not me. What's going on? I think it's that we really don't understand what competition is about right now. I think we're sort of OK thinking about the institutional level of competition. Right? Because then we're thinking, well, if the nation's more competitive, that means you know, that we're all having the economy stronger, we don't have you know, less foreign affairs issues, we're you know, nation leader, well, that's all good. You know, if the Razorbacks have you know, got a winning record, well, that's all good. We're not really thinking about how we got there. But especially if we're not talking about in a particular contest, to say you're competitive is all about how you get there. And I think right now, we have this concern, a question, especially with all the problems with the recession and all the bad stuff going on and the crazy stuff going on in New York politics and the crazy stuff going on Wall Street. We sort of have these questions. Do you have to be a killer to be competitive? Do you have to be cutthroat? Is there anything called work-life balance for someone who wants to be competitive at work? Or do you have to be cutthroat, kill your best friend, crush everybody in your path? I think that's what we worry when someone says, ooh, you're competitive. That it's the same person who is trying to get a promotion at work, deals with that effort, that battle, as fiercely they do trying to get a parking space at Dillard's at Christmas. <laughs> but happily, the science says no. The science says that to be a great competitor, there is a thing called adaptive competition, and there's maladaptive competition. Adaptive competition is understanding it can take a really long time to be good at something. And in the meantime, you may lose. But you respect your opponent. You understand, hey, I got the wind knocked out of me today, but I learned from this experience. The other guy, he worked harder, he did better. I can do better next time because I've learned from this experience. And I've realized that getting my kid in college or getting a promotion is not the same as the parking spot in Dillard's. I can let that one go, at least for one more aisle. Adaptive competition is that belief. Yeah, I can let it go. And what's interesting is I think right now there's sort of a fear you know, competition innately breeds bad behavior. Well, we looked actually at the first competition, first culture to ever really think about competition in ancient Greece. And in ancient Greece, they actually had this construct of aratas. And aratas, there will be mistranslations, you'll see them, people say, oh, it's excellence. No, it wasn't excellence. It was through competition, 
that competition was the greatest virtue. Because when you were competing, you had to have strategy, you had to have problem solving, leadership skills, you had to have character, you had to be brave, you had to be physically fit. Everything you had learned, you had to use in that competition on that one day and see if you could do it. And because of that, it was a concretization and encapsulation of all of those other virtues. How different I think that perspective is. If I said at the beginning of this, who here would love to be told I have aritas, might get more hands than one and a half, right? So what are the factors then in competition? What are those things that you are asking about? What are the things that are that adaptive competition that we all want? That's what I want to talk about for the rest of this time is those cultural, personal, genetic, physiological, biological, personality things that are driving competitiveness. So let's do the first most obvious one, just looking around this room. And, and she was, and maybe part of this is, she's a girl. Did everybody notice that she's a girl who said she was very competitive? Are girls supposed to be competitive? especially here in the South. Aren't you supposed to be ladylike? Come on. <laughs> but I think that's a question. Can women compete? Are women competitive? Are they innately less competitive than men? I think in the business community, actually, for a while, one of the stories has been, no, women aren't as competitive as men. Their strength is coalition building. In fact, when I was serving the co in the Clinton administration, I'd worked on a presidential campaign. I was going to law school at night. I'm working in the White House, and people are handing me books about women's leadership skills, and they're things like, women aren't supposed to be competitive. Your strength is coalition building. And I thought this was crazy. I was like, aren't I fighting for things I believe every day? Every one of us is fighting for things we believe every day. How is that not competitive? So, I have to say, when we started writing a book about competition, and we asked, well, should we write about gender differences? I was like, no. I don't want to hear it. Because I don't want that to be used as an excuse, then. Women can't break the glass ceiling because they can't really be competitive. They're just not as tough as guys. I didn't want to leave that. I didn't hear it. And there was another reason which was when we were writing Nurture Shock, we would read about the science of kids and we'd read about gender differences, and there were gender differences in terms of kids' different abilities, but most of them were like a two or three percent difference. And if you thought about that in terms of the context of individual differences, it was meaningless, right? Gender differences were less important than you compared to you, right? And if you think about this in the context of competition, well, it's true to say men have stronger upper body strength, so they're probably better at sports. But if I put the Williams sisters up here, <laughs> stupid, right? So I kept saying, nope, we're not writing about gender differences in competition. And then I kept finding these studies saying there's gender differences in competition. Muriel Niederla at Stanford has found in a lab study where she has people do a task and says, okay, do you want to compete against a couple other people? Or do you, and whoever wins, gets the money, or do you want me, I'll just pay per piece. 75% of the guys, game on, let's do it, I'm there. 35% of the women ready to compete. 40% difference. That's no two or 3% I could ignore. And I was like, hmm, well, that's, that's a little interesting. And then 2010, one more pop quiz, but you know, Clinton School's been in session a couple years, so you guys should be ready for it. Does anybody know how many women filed the form saying, I'm going to run for governor in 2010? And I'm not just talking about run through the primary, through the general, I'm talking about somebody went to a courthouse, went online somewhere, filled a form saying, I want to run for governor. I'll give you a hint, there are 181 adult, million adult women in the United States. 2010, how many? Any guess? Four. 1992 was 34. So if anything, we're going in the wrong direction. I said, well, that's a problem. 
That's something I may need to address, right? Last fall, so many women in Congress, it's up to 18%. If your school administrator or country club or boss said, wow, we've got almost 20% women, would that be a cause for celebration? No. But, you know, we've had decades of women trying, you know, programs. Why aren't more women running in office? And they're still not there. It's because they don't run. It's not because they don't get elected. It's because their names are not on the ballot. Why? Well, Sarah Fulton changed the game for me entirely. Sarah Fulton's a poli-sci professor at Texas A&M, and she surveyed 835 sitting state legislators. So they're already elected, they're already politicians, both women and men. And she asked them two questions. One, what's the likelihood you're gonna run for Congress in the next general? Half of Congress have some experience in state legislators. It's sort of a stepping stone, right? So, you're gonna run for Congress. And two, if you did run, what's the likelihood you'd win? Now, what was fascinating is for those legislators who were planning a career in politics, for the men, the relationship between these two questions, there wasn't one. Didn't care. Yeah, I'm gonna run. Nah, I don't have a snowball's chance of winning. <laughs> Just didn't matter. But the women wouldn't even consider a run unless they had at least a 20% chance of winning. And then it was just a fraction. They really didn't, didn't say yes until they had a 50% chance. And then it went like this. They had a 100% chance of winning. The predecessor died in office and willed them all of their money and their phone banking. Yes, I'm running. The guys, still like this. Just didn't matter. Even a guy who was guaranteed of winning was no more likely to run than someone who was sort of guaranteed. And then we looked back at that Stanford research. Muriel Niederle's research with all those women where you're gonna compete or not, tells us nothing about how women compete in the moment. There's no evidence that women compete less hard in the competition. The difference is the decision to compete in the first place. And we've found this now in Muriel's studies, studies around the world, studies with Texas judges and New York judges. Basically, men and women have a different take on when I should compete. Women are really good at calculating the odds of success and men are really good at ignoring them. <laughs> now, if you think about this in politics, 2012, catastrophic year for congressional incumbents. You saw that on the news. I know, those poor incumbents, they only won 87% of the time. Normally, they win 90 to 95% of the time. The women go, Pfft. That's just not good enough odds for me. I'm going to go get another graduate degree, or I'm going to go work as a lobbyist, or I'm going to do this. I'm going to resume build until that seat's vacant, and then I'm there. So it's not that one approach is right or wrong, but we need to think about this in terms of contexts. Men and women on Wall Street, how are they doing? Turns out, in a study of three million financial analyst reports, we're talking about not buy or sell, but the analysts who are telling you predictions, this company is gonna go up in value, this company is going down, that kind of thing. 20,000 analysts, 20,000 stocks, three million reports. The women were 7.3% more accurate than the men. The women, actually disproportionately, there's about 16% of financial analysts on Wall Street are women, and they're disproportionately represented on the all-star list when it comes out, but the regular female analyst is as good as the male all-star. Why? Because the women want to be right. They're looking at those odds. In fact, you would think, well, are women more tepid in these recommendations? They're actually bolder. When a woman puts out something, even if it's on the limb, everybody else changes. Oh my gosh, we think that company's going through the toilet, but the woman's already said it's good, she does not change. And when a woman analyst does change, the stocks move more when she makes a change than her male counterparts. 
because people and women understand that these women are actually being bolder in their predictions. Women, more women on an audit committee, that company gets audited less. Women on a board, the company for mergers and acquisitions, the employee company is stable, the mergers are smaller and more stable. But somebody's got to run for Congress. What about entrepreneurs? If you were an entrepreneur, whether you were wanting to be the next Bill Gates or a small mom and pop shop, the odds are against you. You're going to go down in flames. The only way you can do it is to ignore the odds and say, but I've got a vision of what I can do. And I worry that in Silicon Valley right now, only 4% of, of venture, of venture, funded, venture capital funded companies are held by women. And I think it's because in a VC meeting, the guy says, well, I've got a proposal. We don't have any sales yet, but I think this is probably a $2 billion industry in five years. That may be lowballing, but I think we're going to get there. And a woman comes into that same meeting and says, well, we don't have any sales yet, but I've got some orders. I think we've got about 50,000 by the end of the year, and then by the next two quarters, we'll have 100,000. I think in about five years, we may have around a $200 million well, it'll be a $200 million market. We'll probably have a 10% share at that point. And all of her numbers may be absolutely right. Who gets funded? The guy who has a $200 billion company he hasn't started yet because he has the vision of where to go. And, and the VCs are expecting to be sold on the vision, not the real numbers. So we've got to make sure that we always are looking for this question of, when do you play the odds? Now, you may say, I'm a woman, and people tell me all the time I ignore the odds, and I just go for it. OK, when are you Pollyannish? If you're a guy, and you're thinking, wow, I kind of occasionally take the odds, you might want to ask some woman what she would think. <laughs> but that's sort of the question, is when do we have these odds? What is the focus? And one of the main interesting things to do, we write in the book about how it's the difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. Now, you hear those thrown around in sports metaphors all the time, but it's not just a metaphor. They have real consequences in terms of strategy. Someone who's playing to win is focused on the big picture. They don't want to hear about details. Details are distraction. They want to hear compliments. They want to hear praise about what they're doing right so that they can keep doing it. Right? They're focused on moving forward. They don't want to do an after action report of what the mistakes were. They're going, they're going. Someone who's playing not to lose, for them, well, if you're playing to win, is a tie good enough? No, you didn't win, you got a tie. If you're playing not to lose, a tie's a win. Because playing not to lose is about focusing on preventing a disaster that you think is coming. You don't learn from compliments because what you want to do is fix the mistakes that you know were there. So don't give me this, this silly puffery about how great I am. I want to know what I need to do better. The exact opposite you need to hear if you're playing not to lose. You're focused on the details, because it's that one detail you miss that's going to be that house of cards that takes everybody out. Now, some people go, oh, well, playing not to lose, that must be for losers. No. The number one football team in the country thinks every other team's out to get them, and they are. <laughs> the top salesman at a firm, everybody's out to get me. They're just waiting for me to screw up, and they are. So, but the problem is that even these winners can get into this mode of playing not to lose and forget the risk taking and the fearlessness and entrepreneurialism that got them where they were and the success that they actually had to drive them to the position, once they're there, switches, right? As an entrepreneur, it's really easy to say this is a $200 billion interest and we've got to expand and we've got to do this. But once you've got a big room full of stockholders saying, what are the quarterlies, what are the quarterlies, you switch. And when you think, oh, playing not to lose, that, you know, nobody wants to do that. We're playing to win. That's my life. Who wants a surgeon who's playing to win? Who wants an architect who's playing to win? 
Who wants a reporter playing to win? Well, you know, the big picture's right. I got the facts wrong, but you know, the, the idea is there. Most of our life, in your day-to-day -day jobs, you're being told, focus on the details, get everything right, prevent the mistakes. We're being pushed all the time to that playing not to lose mindset. So we always want to talk about overconfidence and underconfidence. One of the interesting things when I've been writing about Top Dog is I used to talk, because I'm a science reporter, but I like, my beat is humans. And I used to think, well, there's psychology, and then there's physiology. And now I've realized they're almost indistinguishable. When you're thinking about playing to win versus playing not to lose, that changes your physiological response in the moment. The researchers talk about the difference between a challenge and a threat. A challenge is when you think you can do it. Winning is not guaranteed. I can't just promise you winning is guaranteed. And the more you're going to think about the likelihood of success, the more you're not going to do it. Right? Powerball last night, 250 million. If you're standing there in line thinking, I'm going to win. This is what I'm going to do with all the money. You stand in line. If you're thinking, the odds of my winning, you leave, right? So anytime you're thinking, wow, there's no way this is going to happen, that's going to change it. This challenge idea, I can do this, there's a chance. Your heart rate changes, your heart rate variability changes, the blood flow changes. Some people in lab studies have had two and a half liters extra of blood pumping out of their heart per minute. The glucose in your changes. Your lungs expand. If you're in a threat state, I don't think I can do this. I didn't study enough for this test. I'm scared. Uh, the other guy's got the edge on me in the promotion. I'm just not going to do this. Your heart rate variability goes down. Your blood pressure goes up. The vessels in every part of your body constrict so that there's more more pressure but less circulation. Your glucose is burned off of the stored glucose in your body, which gives you that initial spurt of energy, and then you just get tired and you can't get back. If you were in a challenge state, your platelets in your blood thicken, so if you got cut, you could keep on fighting. If you kind of think about it, I, mentally I always think about a blowout football game. The guys who are winning are hopping up and down Right? They're all going like this, getting the crowd to cheer for them. And they have more energy at the end of the competition than at the beginning. The guys on the other side have played just as long a game, but they're like, <gasps> you can just see them like, <gasps> they, couldn't, they can't catch a breath, they're holding their legs because they're so tired. They're in a threat state. Their lungs are literally contracting. They can't get air because of the psychology. And right now, the cutting edge research of this is actually saying, can we change one or the other? And what would happen? Jeremy Jameson had Harvard, Harvard undergrads who were practicing for the graduate record exam. Any of you Clinton students probably still going, Jerry? Um, well, during the practice exam, he said, now some of you might feel stress. But recent research has actually said that stress doesn't necessarily mean you could do be poorly. You might actually be doing better. So don't be worried if you're feeling stressed during the practice exam. Now, Jeremy didn't explain that the recent research he was referring to was the study he was actually conducting on those poor people. <laughs> but what happened is that the students who'd actually heard that scored 50 points higher on the math part of the practice section. And in the real GRE, they scored 65 points higher. Being told you're not stressed, you're excited, changed the physiology so that they were actually able to do it. Testosterone is another one of those things. I think another reason why, you know, we started, oh, well, women can't be as competitive as men. And a lot of researchers sort of scratch their head. Well, that could, that could be. What is that? Testosterone isn't about aggression. Who here, before I just said that, thought testosterone meant aggression? Only three, two, only three honest people, I'm guessing more, <laughs> heard heard, that if you had testosterone, you had more aggression. There's no correlation between testosterone and aggression. None. Testosterone is the biological equivalent 
of motivation. It's the thing that helps propel you do something that gets you approval. Now, if you're in boxing, what might give you approval is aggression, taking somebody out. Then you'll get some testosterone. But researchers have found that firefighters, the best firefighters with the highest testosterone, they're known for that daring do rush in the building, rescue everyone and the goldfish and the cat. But high testosterone paramedics, they're known for conscientiousness, conscientiousness and note taking. Because that's what the doctors value when they get to the ER. They don't want to hear that you invented some new technique in the ambulance on the way. They want to know exactly what you treated him, what the symptoms are, so that they can take it from here. So testosterone is about motivation and what we value. And this is just as true for women as it is for men. On average, women have about one-seventh the amount of testosterone that men do, but it's not about the baseline. It's about the change in environment. Chess players have higher testosterone before a competition, and the one with the highest level of testosterone wins the competition. A study of college students about to take a science final, you could predict who was getting the best grades by their testosterone levels before they took the test. A study of facial surgeons who were doing these complex rebuilding of jaws because of cancer tumors and things like that had a 500% increase of testosterone the, mor the morning before their most complicated surgeries. It's about getting up for the competition, knowing what's important and what you can pass by. That changes your mindset, it changes your physiology and your ability to actually do it. That's why even though people love it, positive thinking doesn't work. Sorry. Olympians who walk around the Olympic trials going, I'm so great, don't make the squad. The ones who say, wow, I screwed up, I'm gonna do better on this next flip. Those are the gymnasts you're gonna see. Competition is about inspiring other people to do new things. The benefit of competition is not winning. The benefit of competition is improving performance, doing better than you ever expected you could, and pushing further to that. When I think about the ancient Greeks talking about aratos, great problem solvers, people who can lead, people who have strategy, people who have vision of where we need to go, who can use all of what they've learned, we don't call them great competitors anymore. We call them great innovators. We name them people like Steve Jobs. Great competition is innovation. It's about pushing yourself, your spirit, and those around you to ever new heights. That's what I want us to think about. I want us, the next time it says you're competitive, to say, yeah, I'm more competitive than you are. And with that, I think we'll have some questions. Great. Thanks, Ashley. I don't remember her being that competitive in 1992. I was Out competing for a cause, I not know. for me. No, outstanding presentation, by the way. Thank you. It was the best, right? <laughs> well, it was close to Allie's. No, very good. Okay, questions. Anybody with it? Please raise your hand, and, and, and here comes the microphone. Um, do you see a correlation between those that play not to lose and avoidant personality disorder and those that play to win and maybe have a narcissistic personality disorder? That's a really great question. Um, there was actually an interesting study of Israeli championship tennis players, and they found that those who were avoidant and had um, actually, a, you know, the buzzword in developmental psychology for kids is about attachment. And those who were insecurely attached to their family and, you know, have sort of distant relationships were better singles players, whereas those who were securely uh, attached were better in doubles. So I think that, you know, maladaptiveness, to me, maladaptive competition is about narcissism. Because narcissism is that lack of respect for the opponent. It's believing I win. In fact, 
the rules, the rule keepers, they're the bad guys. Because if they truly appreciated my greatness, they would just give me the award. And the research has actually showed that people who are you know, higher in narcissism are more likely to cheat because it's the same thing. You've wrongly thwarted me. And researchers um, have sort of looked and found that there's pretty, you know, like four more main responses to competition in, in terms of how you win or lose. And that the sore winner is the same person who's the sore loser. The gracious winner is the gracious loser. And the sore winner, the sore loser, is the guy who says, hey, this is mine. So ab they're absolutely related. <laughs> yes, question. This is the School of Public Service. Uh, it's a giving of yourself to help others or to build a better world. How does competition fare with thinking of giving of self? Well, I think in many different levels. I mean, for one thing, you know, people talk to me sometimes about, you know, well, doesn't competition matter on your definition of success? I think everybody has their own definition of success, but for some people that's going to be start a foundation and cure malaria in six weeks or six years or whatever it is. And they're going to be competitive in terms of the passion to move them forward. They're not necessarily taking other people out, but it's about finding that motivation to help them move forward. And if you look, I think institutions that are trying to figure out new ways to have public service, competitions are a great way to do it. I mean, most of the technological innovations that we use every day, a lot of them come from a competition. The next time you go to a pantry, the reason you have bottled goods and canned goods in your pantry is because Napoleon needed a way to feed his troops. So he had a contest to figure out how to do it. And the winner bottled things. Napoleon III wanted a butter substitute, and that's why we have margarine. Got a question right here. Here comes the microphone to you. How does competition work in a zero-sum game? game where if I win, someone else loses, and how does that affect sharing for the good of the whole? Well, I think that right now there's sort of an idea that it's either competition or cooperation. And I think that's not a fair concept, because most of us are actually competing, at least in a team, right? The classmates you have, you may be competing against students at Yale or students or wherever, but so you're, so you're cooperating within the organization. So a lot of times, I don't think they're in the, quite the anathema we think they are. That's the first thing to talk about. One is, if you look again at competition sort of over the long term, you have to decide what's important. And you may say, this one, it's not important, so we should just split it up. It's kind of hard to think about it in, like in, a, in a philosophical what's a zero-sum game without actually having a game. There's actually a philosopher who's um, James Cars who thinks about it in terms of infinite games and finite games. And in an infinite game, there are no winners, and the idea is just that you keep going. So we change the rules to keep you going. We change everything to keep going. Whereas an, a finite game has a period of time, there's winners, there's losers, the rules don't change, and we just say, okay, you're in or you're out. Sure. Yes, you can. Hold on. Wait for the microphone. Wait for the, mic wait for the microphone. If you have something more specific in mind, then that would help me give you a better answer. Okay. Uh, for instance, one of the ways supposedly to motivate teacher excellence is to rank teachers from highest to lowest and give out merit pay mm -hmm. so that if you're ranked first, somebody else has to be ranked below you. And that often that seems to prevent sharing and collegiality and, and doesn't provide a good atmosphere. Okay, that was, now I can, now I can go to town on that. Um, ranking is really interesting because first there is, you know, a, there is a split. For one thing, there's a gender difference. Because men on average tend to be overconfident and women tend to be underconfident, right? Men sort of expect even in a new task, I'm gonna be better at this. Women sort of expect at a job interview, everybody else has got more experience than I do, so I'm just gonna tough it out kind of a thing. And then in a study where they looked at uh, a national furniture company for sales, 
They said, we're going to tell everyone their rank. And they thought, well, this will be a motivator. And sales dropped 26% for the year. But almost all of the drop was actually men. Because the men had thought, I'm the best salesman in the, in the, in the store, so I must be one of the best in the country. And it destroyed them to realize that they were 300th in the company. And the women hadn't had that high expectation, so they weren't really as concerned. So they went, oh, I'm 300th in the country. OK, that's fine. That's better than I probably thought I would do. So in one way, and you know, teachers obviously are predominantly women, so that's one issue that I think we need to think about is that there are gender differences. But it's also one of the more interesting studies about teachers and rankings specifically is that teachers who focus on who's worse than them, you know, the ones who read about the stories about the teachers in the rubber rooms and whatever, they burn out and drop out. They get frustrated, they say, there's no point. The teachers who focus on the teachers who are better than them actually stay in the career longer, they're more passionate and they're more inspired because they see that amount for growth. So for there, it's not, I don't think it's a zero sum game, it's about the, the idea of can I use this as a benchmark to keep moving forward or do I use this that I'm being lumped with those bad apples and I don't like it. And because I'm being lumped with the bad apples, I'm not going to share my ideas with others. I'm not going to help other teachers because I have to sort of cut myself off. But of course that's going to be dispiriting. Of course that's going to be upsetting. You need to have that focus, I can improve, we're all going to improve, rather than focusing on the sort of classic GM, there's three of you and you know 30% of you were cut by the end of the year. Uh, yes, uh, let's see, question at the back right here. So back to one of your original questions about women running for office, given this tendency, what is the solution What's or the proposal, anecdote? right, the anecdote to get them? It's a great question. I think that there's generational things we can do to raise girls differently, get to that. I also think that we need to sort of reshape the mindset. You know, it's interesting when they ask, politicians who are you know contemplating a race what are the factors that you're thinking about guys will say well you know running the race is going to be such a great experience for my family we're going to spend so much time together we're all going to go knocking on doors and, and it'll be good for my family because everyone will you know our status in the community will raise and we'll have more connections so this will help my kids in the future they're looking at this as in terms of what the benefits are not even of winning but just the sheer race will benefit them and the moms who are, who are considering a race go, I'm going to be away from my kids so much, and it's going to be so hard on them, and it's going to be tough for my marriage. And they start really being focused on those negatives. And again, then, the risk of winning, the risk of losing is just too high. I mean, you do see if women are about 40% on school boards. There's 550,000 estimated elected positions in the United States. To put that in perspective, there's about 300,000 computer programmers. So I think some of it is giving women the opportunity to have races that they feel are doable and then more actively using them as a stepladder to keep going. If you want, I can talk about the developmental stuff, but you have questions. But I love the developmental All stuff. Right. So someone asked me about the developmental stuff. In connection with uh, being competitive and uh, having vision and so forth, talk a little bit about the, the role of persistence. Crucial. Persistence is everything. And I think that persistence right now, people have been, the, I think that even the past year or so, the new buzzwords for kids is about persistence and grit. And the key is seeing that long term. I don't want to use this one bad grade, this one bad day and then give up. And actually, in some of the interesting research about kids, you find that boys in the 90th and 95th percentile would actually learn more math in less competitive schools. And this is not an example where they're under-competing, they're actually over-competing. Because it's just really always frustrating to be number third in the class. There's nothing I can do to be number one. He's just crushing me every day. And at a certain point, they just sort of get frustrated. So we need to have ways, I, I think the, the best route to have for competition for kids right now is my mental image of it as a roller coaster. That 
you know, you're ex really excited about the science fair or the football game or whatever, and you're preparing for it, and you're emotionally getting prepared, and you've studied, and you worked, and you have the competition, and then win or lose, you kind of go down, and then there's this moment when you just have recuperate. You recover, and then you're ready for the next one. So it's that being able to see one thing and that it's not a one-shot deal. Competition is this long-term. And if you're looking that every single quiz is the make or break, it's just going to be too exhausting. You need to instead find out in that, person, in that pattern. I know we got a lot, a lot of questions, but we also need to save time for her to sign this book. And you can visit with her as you come by. This is Top Dog, and uh, I hope you will purchase it. Thank you all. Ashley, great job. Welcome back to Little Rock. <laughs>